thanks for having me, having me with you. If you don't know me, my name's Dave. If you do know me, my name is still Dave. Um, I live in a little place called Biker up in the uh, east end of Newcastle. And generally, my job is to try and get churches doing some youth work. And my job's made very easy by the churches wanting to do youth work. So that's great. I'd like to tell you three stories today. Um, each of those stories encompasses the whole of everything ever. So I'll try and keep them small, otherwise we'll be here for a while, and I'd like to go home and go to bed. The first story is the state of this world. The state of this world, as Adam was saying, and the state of this world, as we all know, is a little bit messed up. I think we can agree on that. I know that um, where I live, there's all sorts of pictures of that brokenness just come hitting me in the face day after day. The other day, I walked home and I found that there was a car on fire, not mine, but still a car on fire, underneath the tree where the kids collect conkers with fireworks launching out of it and more police cars than I could be bothered to count all around it. That's a bit of a messed up situation. I live in a place where we have this beautiful church building that is leaking and more often than not has holes in the windows as people try to break into it and get whatever they can. And jokes on them, there's nothing worth anything in there. I live in a place where I once had a, a kid who wanted to come to the youth club so much, but he was too young, and I thought I'd get him out. I'd say, do you want me to go and ask your mum how old you are? Because I knew he wasn't old enough. And I went to ask mum, and mum said, oh, yeah, he's that age. The, the date on the form's wrong. And he's wearing a year six uniform, and this says he's year eight. No, 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 no. That's, oh, parents are meant to be on my side. I'm the youth worker. Kids are meant to be on my side, too, because I'm cool. But it's just... Such a mess of thing. And then you look further afield. You look at the world and the news. And, and I love the watching while sanity dies. That's how I feel looking through Twitter at the moment. It's just, this world is so messed up and broken. And we live in it, so we get a bit desensitized. But even still, it's broken. That's story number one. See, I told you very quick. Story number two, the church. Look around you. Isn't it beautiful? Look how wonderful this is. Because there's this broken, messed up, rubbish news over here. But God knows what he's doing. God has raised up the church, the most wonderful, perfect solution to this ever. This church that is going to go into these communities and spread good news and see the spirit break out and see these people <laughs> transformed and everything is going to be made right. How beautiful is that? He's going to have these people who will gather together on a Sunday and then go out into their workplaces and everybody they meet will be healed of their afflictions and fall down in repentance and all of their intellectual barriers to the existence of God will fade as they see how we love each other. Have you ever had a bag of crisps? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever looked at it and thought, oh, there's a lot of crisps in there? Have you ever opened the bag of crisps and let the air escape and see a little rubbish... Have you ever got an, an, a voucher, you know, 50% off when you spend £300 between the hours of 1.55 and 1.57 in the morning on a Tuesday? Did anybody a few months ago lean to their friend and just say, it's coming home? <laughs> if you did, you've experienced the same disillusionment that I do so often. This picture of the church, unfortunately, doesn't really, doesn't really work out, does it? I find myself so disillusioned with the church. And that word, I think, is really important, disillusioned, because I want this to be what the church is, this brilliant, wonderful thing. But actually, ultimately, it's an illusion, isn't it? And it breaks down. And so the story of brokenness hits this in the face, and the illusion, the smoke and mirrors, the smoke clears, the mirror shatters. The gospel's meant to be good news for the poor the outcast, the orphan, all the rest. And yet, after years of sharing that good news with people, such trivial alternatives as, hey, I want to get some drugs, or um, I want to go and get this job, or whatever else, win out against the offer of knowing the creator of the universe. The prayer of faith is meant to be effective, but antisocial behavior still defines young people in the estate where I live. I have the picture of, these, of the church as these carriers of the good news who can and should be able to transform the darkness of Biker, the darkness of this world, the darkness of everything that we go into and live through. The world should watch as everyone we meet is freed from addictions, repent of their sin, follow Jesus, worship in the spirit and truth, and make disciples. And yet, that's not exactly what I see. What I see is people who spend all their time arguing about the latest divisive topic, investing in things that just don't matter, Moving to the flipping south, that's a bugbear of mine. Why is everyone going to the south? There's stuff in Biker to come and help in, and there's stuff in Berniston. 
We spend our time fundraising for broken roofs rather than loving broken people. And so this illusion of how I want the church to be falls away. You've got this story of brokenness, and we've got a story of optimism that I wish was true, but the more I live through it, the more I realize it's not a very good story. Thankfully, there's a third story, and it's a story that all of the prophets through the whole Bible invite us into. And that story is, I'm going to call it the subversion or the subversive story. And the reason why I want to call it that is because this story over here is real. This story may be an illusion, but this story is real. This brokenness is so tangibly real that we feel it every day, even though we know God in the midst of it. It's so real that actually the church that should be so wonderful is tainted by it every day as we find new things to bicker about or fall out about or new things despite our best efforts going wrong. This brokenness is in our politics, it's in our countries, it's in our world, it's in our individual relationships, and it's even inside our own hearts and minds and frail, weak human bodies. This is a real story. This is a version of the reality we live in. But there is a subversion, a story that goes underneath this. And it goes underneath this because it was here first. It goes underneath this because it's deeper. It goes underneath this because this gets shouted at us by the media. This gets shouted at us by each other, by our own minds, by our own experiences. And yet there is something that is quieter, but is more lasting, is more true, is more real, and ultimately it's going to last for longer and it's going to put its head above the surface and it's going to... So let's have a look at some of that story. We've got... Uh, can we have the Isaiah, please? We've got this passage in Isaiah. And the way I like to see prophets is they're, not, they're looking at this world. And they're not saying, you know what, it's going to be great, it's going to be like this. But they're saying, you know what, in amongst this brokenness, there is something worth looking at. Let me turn your eyes to that, say the prophets. And so... God speaking through Isaiah says, here is my servant. He is brokenness, absolutely. I spent 41 chapters talking about that, says Isaiah. Here is brokenness, but here is my servant. Look away. In Matthew chapter 12, this passage is attributed to Jesus. So here is Jesus. Don't look at the brokenness. And you know what? Don't look at your ideal picture of what you hope for. Here is Jesus. He I uphold. He's my chosen one in whom I delight. I'll put my spirit on him and he'll bring justice to the nations. Next one, please. He will not shout or cry out. This is the subversion. He's not going to be going around and everyone sort of hear it because the brokenness is loud. But nevertheless, this is my servant. This next line I really, really like. A bruised reed he will not break. Does anybody play a wind instrument? Yep. Has anybody ever tried a, a wind instrument with a reed? Has anyone ever tried to play that with a broken reed? How's the sound? Oof, oof. I considered, have you ever got a piece of grass and stuck it between your thumbs and gone, and it makes a horrible noise? I considered doing that, but thought I'd like you all too much not to. But this, this idea of a bruised reed, it, it's that musical thing. Back in the day, back when this was written, shepherds out on the fields get bored, because let's face it, sheep are boring. They're adorable for a bit, and then you realize how boring they are. They're not very good conversationalists. So you get yourself a reed, and you cut your little holes into it, and you use it to make some music. People think that's why David was so good at playing music to Saul when he was serving in the king's court, because he'd practiced for nights and nights and nights on this reed. But then, if that gets bruised and bent, oh, you don't want to make music on that. <laughs> you can back me up. It's, it's not good at all. So you throw it away, because you're in a field, there's reeds everywhere, so you get a reed from over here, and you just do the whittling, and it's fine. And you, you, I don't know if you hold it this way or that way, I've never seen it happen, but you, you, you play your reed, and then it bruises, and, you, and it's going to get bruised, because it's just a reed, and you get another one, and the sensible thing to do is to have a reed, and then, oh, it's broken, get another. A candle, going down to a smoldering wick, if you want to light your house, well, you just get rid of that, fire hazard, always blow out your candles, and then you light a new candle. If you're feeling really creative, you gather up the wax that you've melted before and you put it all together and you make your own new candle and you feel very, very creative and crafty and I've never made it work. But what you do is you get rid of it and you start again. And yet, the servant of the Lord, Jesus, a bruised reed I will, he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. I find so much of my life is having to remind myself of this because I sit there in the middle of all this brokenness thinking, you know what, here is a church who is committed 
to reaching out into this broken, miserable area. Here is a church who is willing to take on itself the pain that that entails. Here I get to be with, with my wonderful wife and our lovely baby, and we've decided we're going to be here in this area, and we're so well supported to do that. Your prayers, other people's prayers, people around us who volunteer and help, we are so well supported in that, and yet we look at what's around us, and we think this is just so messed up, and it hurts. It may be that you have a different situation. It may be that you've got a family member who you've been sharing the love of God with for years, and they just aren't getting it. It may be that there's things going on that you just wish would change, either things at work or things with health. It may be whatever it is. It may be, although I'm sure it wouldn't be the case in Berniston, it may be that you come here every week because you know you should, not because it's feeding you spiritually, and it's just... And it's made all the worse by disillusionment of what should be the case. We're doing the mission of God. We are doing what God calls us to. He goes with us. He sends us with his spirit. This should be so much world transforming. And it's not working. Don't get me wrong. I, I've got lots of good stories. I'm going to get to them. But I just don't want to rush past the fact that we are so often bruised. Across this country, the church is declining and declining and declining. Every denomination is going through it. And we look around at this, this, this country and say it needs some gospel, it needs some Jesus, but the church is declining and we get bruised and we get hurt. Across the world, the places where the church is growing fastest is where it's getting persecuted most severely. And those people are literally bruised for what they're doing. We are the light of the world. God is light of the world. He lives in us. We're the light of the world. And yet we feel far more like smoldering wicks. And I'm part of the Church of England, and so often around the place, the Church of England is the one that people go, it's nice they're there, we'll plant a church and do it better. It's nice that they're trying, but they're bruised, they're smoldering wick, get rid of them. They don't use that language, because if they did, they'd realize the Bible's against them. But what Jesus does, what the servant of the Lord does, is he says, this here, this bruised reed, I'm going to use it to make beautiful music. This smoldering wick, I'm going to use it as a light. This church, this individual, this person, this, this faithful follower, this whoever it is, they are still so precious to me. And you know what? This illusion is, is great. You know, it'd be great if we were all fantastic and wonderful, all singing, all dancing, managing it. But looking at the midst of this brokenness, I'd far rather have a God who looks at this brokenness and says, right, I'm coming in and I'm with you in this. And I see your bruising, and I see your pain, and I love you, and we're still going to do some stuff together, and it's going to be great. Rather than a God who goes, hey, look, this is what I wanted. You guys aren't living up. Let's get this going. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here, but it is just those images of the God who doesn't, the servant of the Lord, who doesn't look at the bruise and do the sensible thing, but who does the stupid thing purely out of love and care and tenderness. That is the reality of the God who we know. The brokenness for Israel and the brokenness when this was written is that it's occupied by the Romans. It's occupied by these people. And no, ooh, I'm fast forwarding. Isaiah is here. Fast forward to Jesus coming. Here's my servant. He comes, he arrives. And he arrives in a world occupied by Romans. God has set up this country that's going to be a blessing for the nations. It's going to be this wonderful thing. And hey, look, another nation's come in and taken over, and they're Romans, and they're strutting around. We've got this sorted. Yahweh, pff, our way. And so they go and sit there and occupy. And faithful Jews are looking at this. And somehow they're hoping for this picture of this, this Messiah who's going to come in, and he's going to be, hey, I'm going to overthrow the Romans, get rid of you, we're done, you're free. But they don't get that. And I can imagine so many of the faithful Jews, when they saw Jesus, were disillusioned. They were let down. They thought, this is not what God's meant to do. He's meant to care about us. Why has he sent us a baby in a manger? Why has he sent us this guy who goes around teaching and giving out bread and fish, but every time the Pharisees meet him, yeah, he says some clever things, but actually he's not what we're expecting. Why, why would he send this guy who gets you know, put on a cross before he even does anything of any significance? The brokenness of Jesus' life is what we live through. The brokenness of Jesus is man on a cross saying to a group of tax collectors and fishers, off you go, change the world. And we look at that and we think that is, that's nothing special. But the prophets show us that subversion, that story beneath the story, shows that this is the servant of the Lord. So our next verse 
shows us what this servant of the Lord will do. Because actually, it's all well and good saying that Jesus gets the brokenness. It's all well and good saying that Jesus gets that we're bruised, but loves us still. It's all well and good saying, hey, smoldering wick, I'm going to use it anyway. But actually, this reality, the world is still broken. And this illusion looks like it might fix it. This idea of a church being this amazing, wonderful thing looks like it might fix it. But it's, it's, it's fake. It's not going to fix it. Fake things can't fix things. And Jesus, yeah, it's fine that he gets this brokenness. But ultimately, yes, he did die. Yes, he did rise again. But he left the church. He left this broken, useless, not useless, but he left this broken, miserable thing that is so tired and not doing everything perfect. And so, sorry, my pocket's vibrating. And it's putting me off because it's not my phone. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I am very sorry. Um, I think we're okay. And so, what do we do now? Like, what on earth do we do? Because I want to say that every moment where we're failing and where we're bruised and stuff and Jesus is with us is a beautiful thing, but he still gave us a job to do. He still set up a church that would go and proclaim good news. He still talks about that transformation that I want the church to be. So what do we do? And actually, this verse, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This version of reality, this third story in which the servant of the Lord sees the brokenness and steps right into it, sees our pain and shares in it, sees our failures and loves us the same, has an end to it. And I want to talk about this. I'd love to talk about the story all the way through from Genesis through to the end of Revelation and beyond. It's such an exciting story. This story that the prophets turn our eyes to is worth having our eyes turned to because I would give up on Biker if it wasn't for this story being ultimately true. But this story has moments where God just does something that makes you think, you know what, there's a possibility this is true. When his people are trapped in Egypt in the deepest, darkest slavery, he brings them through the Red Sea. When his people are in exile, where their temple is being destroyed and the worship of God is all messed up and gone, he brings them back to the land that they thought was impossible to return to. When there has been silence from the prophets for years, this baby is born in a manger. When the Messiah himself is dead and buried. He rolls the stone away and brings them straight back out. When the church is looking at its absolute weakest, that is where it grows. And there are times and times again in each of our lives, I'm sure if we stop to look, but across the history of the church, where actually this story is one of brokenness being undone. It's not one of every bit of brokenness being undone. It's not one of, hey, look, we walk around and as our shadow touches people, they repent and believe. But it is one of, from the very first Christians, they told somebody and it worked and it broke in and it changed. They told somebody and it worked and it broke in and it changed. They told somebody and it worked and it broke in and it changed to the point where someone told you guys and it broke in and it changed. That's 2,000 years of this faithful, never-ending story where God is undoing the brokenness of the world, keeps going. And... I don't want to look at those and go, yeah, that's fine, but there's still a brokenness. The end of this story, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. This story, this story that lasts, is going to be shouted down every single step of the way because this story is against the brokenness that defines our world. But this story ends in there will be justice. And every single one of those moments is an excuse to hope that maybe this loud story that we hear, maybe this pain that we feel, maybe this bruise and this smoldering wick that we find the church being, maybe there's still this constant faithfulness of God underneath and maybe this story ends with justice on the earth, with all that pain wiped away. Maybe it ends with God getting to enjoy the creation that he wanted to enjoy with us in the beginning and us getting to enjoy it with him. That doesn't leave answers. That doesn't leave, this is how it's going to happen. But it leaves an excuse to hope that when there's doubts, when there's questions, when it doesn't make sense, when God does answer our prayers, when the church lets us down, when the whole thing utterly collapses because of something trivial, God remains faithful. And I may be as discouraged as I like. And believe me, I've made it an art form. I may want to give up. I may make a massive mess of everything. But he, the servant of the Lord, who went through death and came back, who came into the darkness and remained the light, will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. And so in his teaching, 
I will try to put my hope. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> but that is my excuse to hope. We're about to sing a song called, um, uh, we have sung our songs of victory. Um, and I'm going to ask for confirmation from the band. Are we doing the long instrumental? Can we? No? Okay, that's fine. Go home and listen to the recording. When, um, when Stuart Townsend recorded this song, I think it's him. Let's assume it is. When he recorded the song, he purposely left an uncomfortably long instrumental before the last verse. Because so often, we look at the brokenness of the world and we go, yeah, but my lighthouse will lead me safe to shore. We look at the brokenness in the world and we go, yeah, but good news in Jesus. And we just brush off the pain of it. And actually, I think we cheat people when we do that. I'm not saying those songs are bad. I think those songs are great. But there's a purposeful break in this song before the last verse of actually, how long before you establish justice on the earth? How long before the light breaks into the darkness in my friend's life, in my family member's life, in my life? How long, O oh Lord? And there's an agonizingly long, if you're feeling that, an agonizingly long break. And then and only then do we sing, but I know a day is coming. And I think that's the sort of thing that keeps me going. Like the pain, the bruisedness, it's real. But more deeply real, a day is coming. Let's open that.